Next presentation is uh, may I introduce Mr. Istvan Toth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I would like to talk about practical EDR bypass. Uh, I, you can see that it is a 2022 edition, but uh, unfortunately, fortunately, it could be 2021 because there was no huge difference uh, in this year about EDRs. Uh, I'm István Tóth. Uh, I'm from Hungary, Budapest. I'm based in Budapest. And here is a slide about me. Uh, I work in professional IT security for more than seven years. Currently, I'm working in Red Team. Um, I have various related certs. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> my primary interest is offensive security, enterprise networks, and Active Directory. Uh, this is connecting to EDR, uh, of course. Uh, formerly, I was a CTF player. Now, I do not have uh, much time for that. Before IT security, uh, so I have an MSc in Applied Mathematics, and I worked uh, about it. And I have some uh, social media uh, accounts. If you want to reach me out, uh, I'm active on Twitter. Also have GitHub and LinkedIn. Let's go ahead. Uh, this is a short summary about uh, uh, what would like to, I'd like to talk about. Uh, first, about EDRs. What is EDR? Uh, endpoint detection and respo response. I would like to define what is bypass in my opinion. Uh, I would like to talk about classic but still working bypass methods in 2022. Uh, so there are some easy ones. And an advanced one also, I'd like to give some example uh, of how to, how to use it in red team operations and how adversaries use it against our networks. I would like to give an example, uh, an interesting example about uh, an application uh, uh, called Zoom uh, the, uh, side door trick. And uh, at last, my favorite, uh, I call it living in network protocols. So about EDRs. So EDR is uh, endpoint detection and response. Uh, formerly, it was called antivirus. Uh, now, now, so antivirus uh, was uh, based on static analysis. Uh, antiviruses uh, analyze your binaries and payloads uh, statically, and endpoint detection and response systems uh, did uh, behavior-based alerts at runtime. Uh, now this difference is blurred. Now uh, the products we call AV do also behavior uh, analysis and AV products also have behavior visibility also. And now EDRs are defined with, uh, um, I think, it's more, with more telemetry data and customizable alerts. And, uh, and so, uh, I would, I would not, I wouldn't name specific products uh, in this presentation uh, for various reasons. Uh, one of this is I do not want to give targeted tips for the bad guys. Uh, actually, uh, bad guys also know how to defeat EDRs, but I do not want to uh, make an out of box solutions here. And, and the second one, I do not want to start framework with EDR vendors. Uh, because if I say that some EDRs products, uh, I name uh, an exact EDR product with a bypass, uh, they will challenge it. Uh, it is not a bypass. So I do not want to start this uh, framework. So uh, first, uh, let's see what could be EDR bypass. Uh, it is a, a little bit different on the red, blue uh, side, and even different for vendors. Uh, for me, in an offensive perspective, I would like to say that EDR bypass is, first, no auto prevention was triggered. This is a must. If auto prevention is triggered and our payload is burned, then uh, there is no, uh, we, can, we, we cannot speak about bypass. But this is not enough, uh, because there could be other uh, errors uh, which do not trigger auto prevention. 
So second, uh, I would say that no alerts or no high severity alerts are generated. This is not a must, but a good to have. Also note that uh, everything may depend on custom rules being implemented. So uh, with advanced EDRs and advanced usage of EDRs means that uh, the blue teams can define custom rules for detections and uh, it may vary uh, between, between different EDR installations, different, uh, different enterprises, different uh, networks. So uh, if I say that this is a working bypass, it is not a 100% solution for everywhere. Yeah, and that's what I said in uh, the previous slide. That sometimes vendors say it's not a bypass because it was, uh, it was logged in the telemetry. Uh, okay, uh, and I would challenge this, uh, but what if a malware encrypted everything already? Who cares that uh, there is something in the telemetry? So uh, I think the auto prevention and no high severity alerts are enough uh, for uh, stating that I made a bypass. Uh, how, to, how, to how to develop EDR bypass in, in practice? Uh, it's not easy because EDR products are ex very expensive and the products are not available to the public. Even if you want to test a demo version for a limited, uh, list, limited license, uh, it is usually limited to companies and you cannot ask for uh, demo licenses. So legal testing is severely restricted. There are uh, two consequences. I think uh, the strength comes more from obscurity rather than the features. Uh, and uh, also note that uh, I do not want to mean that uh, these EDR features, uh, I do not underestimate the EDR features uh, with this sentence. So I would say the strength comes more from obscurity, but the features are also uh, Sometimes, uh, sometimes very uh, advanced. Okay, and an important note, uh, what I said before, just because a successful bypass exists doesn't mean the product is not super useful in general. Uh, because uh, the exploitation is a long process uh, with a lot of steps. Uh, so if I made a bypass uh, for an initial foothold or some uh, basic steps, then there could be a chance that one more step ahead and it will trigger an alert. Okay, let's talk about uh, EDR components. Uh, we have three on the endpoint. The EDR components uh, consist of uh, a kernel space EDR driver. There is an EDR service uh, in the user space, but this is a service, this is also a high privileged one. And also, there is an EDR DLL attached in the user process. Okay, this is on the endpoint. And we have, of course, so these, uh, these uh, uh, components do some logging. Uh, the logging is on a company repository or EDR cloud. We also have a console to monitor and, uh, and, uh, and uh, do, some, uh, do, do some things with the EDR. And uh, let's see this on a, a diagram. This is uh, from Sector 7. Sector 7 uh, did a, a very, uh, Sector 7 did a very uh, interesting and useful course for EDR bypasses. Uh, and this is taken from this course. Uh, this is the detection technique uh, in a diagram. Uh, the components, uh, in the lower part of the diagram, uh, the EDR driver, and uh, there is the kernel COBEX connected to the EDR driver. The EDR driver also monitors the disk and network activity. Uh, there is the EDR service. There is the user process. Uh, when, a user process when a user process starts, the EDR service and driver uh, injects the EDR DLL into the user process, and the user process also uh, have other DLS, normal DLS loaded, the Windows DLS, and the Windows DLS contains the Windows API functions, and the Windows API functions gets hooked. I will try to show this uh, on the next slide, but uh, 
let's see uh, how can we attack this uh, detection technique. We can attack these detection techniques anywhere we want. So we can, we can attack or the EDR driver, the EDR service, the EDR DLL, the logging, uh, uh, the logging process, or anything else. Uh, the question is, what should we try to uh, defeat first? And in my opinion, and in my experience, I found that at attacking the EDR DLL itself, or the user process, and uh, getting rid of the EDR DLL from there, is the best uh, or easiest thing that uh, we may do. And I also found that this is, uh, this is al almost, the, almost, the, uh, almost the best, uh, best thing to do. Why? Because uh, the EDR DLL uh, attached to the user process uh, doesn't have privileges. It runs uh, also with the user process privileges. And if the attacker only has the user process privileges, uh, then it is free uh, to modify the user process and the EDR DLL. For attacking other uh, stuff in the diagram, for example, the kernel callbacks, if you want to remove the kernel callbacks, you have to you have attached driver in kernel space, uh, you have to, uh, have to have high uh, kernel privileges. But for attacking the user process, you do not, do not need to do this. Yep. So here is the EDR uh, DLL in the user process. Uh, as I told earlier, uh, here, is a, here is a debugger. Here is a debugger attached. Uh, to a user process, and here is the anti-dll.dll. Uh, the anti-dll.dll contains uh, syscalls. You, uh, the, red, the red ones are the syscalls, and there are the functions, uh, the Windows API functions, and so you can see that some of them is a little bit different than the normal, this is hooked. That is the jump instruction uh, at, the at the first instruction of the call. And if you follow the jump instruction, it will land in the EDR DLL itself. And the EDR DLL uh, does some checking and uh, validates that the call parameters or analyzes memory, memory regions and uh, try to search for malicious activities. And if it finds malicious activities, uh, then it will send uh, the required alert uh, to the EDR logging system. And uh, what is really nice for the attacker, that these jump instructions could be overwritten uh, by the user process uh, privileges. So this is uh, called EDR hook bypass. Uh, this is a classic. This is a classic attack against EDRs, uh, and I, in my experience, it is still working now in 2022. So this is called DLL uncooking. Actually, this eliminates EDR DLL activities in the user process. Uh, I do not want to say that this blinds the whole EDR, but reduces the visibility seriously. Uh, and this. Uh, Visibility reduction is enough uh, for a lot of, uh, for a lot of uh, offensive operations. If you want to do this unhooking in easy mode, uh, this is called DLL refreshing. Uh, you do not have to search for every DLL call and uh, check for uh, jump instructions, is it hooked or not. There is an easier trivial method. Uh, this is what uh, uh, the bad guys do if they want to bypass the EDR, overwrites in memory hooked versions by the original disk version. So if anti DLL is hooked, uh, you have to do easy, very easy stuff. Just read uh, the anti DLL from the disk. This is, original, this is the original version. This is unhooked and replace uh, the code section in the uh, user process with this original one. There are other more difficult bypasses, uh, direct syscalls. Uh, this is called syswhispers, uh, but we do not want to cover this in this presentation because in my experience, I did not uh, need to do this. DLL refreshing was enough. 
there is reference implementation uh, in this uh, URL, the iread.team uh, site uh, by Spot the Planet. So anti DLL, DLL on the disk with the green clean uh, text action. Let's overwrite the anti DLL, the DLL in memory. That's all. Uh, in my experience, I also had to do it for other DLLs. Uh, EDR products not only uh, hook the, uh, the anti DLL, the DLL. Anti DLL, the DLL is a, is a special DLL because it is the last layer between the user processor and the kernel. Uh, other DLLs. Uh, uh, call at last the anti-DLL uh, functions and anti-DLL do the anti-DLL do the syscalls uh, which lands on the kernel space. So hooking anti-DLL uh, by the EDRs is uh, is a uh, it's very important because it is the last one uh, b before the kernel layer. Uh, but I found that uh, most EDRs. Uh, have a lot of uh, hooking uh, in other DLLs. Also, uh, if I uh, included the unhooking or the refreshing process, included the kernel based the DLL and kernel 32 the DLL, it was uh, enough uh, to bypass uh, a lot of things. Okay, so this was DLL refreshing. Uh, this was some behavior analysis uh, evasion. I found that uh, usually this is not enough because there are uh, new features uh, implemented. Uh, it is rather uh, the static analysis than the behavior-based ones, but this is also uh, an important uh, thing to bypass. Entropy, it is based on an entropy. Entro what is entropy? Entropy is a measure of randomness. It is a mathematical, uh, mathematical measure from information theory, uh, there is a mathematical formula to calculate uh, the entropy. I do not want to dive into the details. Uh, why is this important? Because it may, may be the entropy, it may be an indicator of malware. How? Uh, the binary payload is, uh, how does a binary payload look like? It has a loader, and usually it has an encrypted or packed shellcode or DLL or something what the loader wants to load. Why? Because uh, we want to, want to evade uh, easy static analysis, and that's why we use encryption and the loader uh, with decryption, and uh, finally um, some shellcode running. Uh, but the encrypted or, and compressed data uh, usually seems like uh, random bytes. If you encrypt something and the encryption is good, uh, then the result will be a random sequence with high entropy. And the EDR guess is high entropy data in binaries uh, means encryption on compression. And if there is some encryption in binaries, uh, EDRs flags it as malware and burn these files immediately. So uh, EDR uh, doesn't know how to decrypt it. Uh, but uh, the encrypted binaries are uh, put in the set of malware. So for bypass, uh, and if you use such payloads, we need to lower the entrop entropy somehow. Uh, here are some entropy examples. Entropy per section of a PE file, Calc exe, exe, Calc exe this, is a, this is the standard uh, Windows calculator. Uh, there is the entropy graph uh, of the of this binary, and here is uh, in the in the lower uh, diagram. Here is a, a malicious uh, binary, a beacon. Uh, this is actually this is a cobalt strike beacon. Uh, you can see that the green part is the loader. It is the text section of the PE file. And the other one is the encoded or encrypted uh, data. And you can see that the entropy is high uh, compared uh, to the calculator. And this, uh, this one, the beacon EXE, is uh, immediately burned uh, by most of the EDRs based on entropy detection. OK, how can we lower the entropy? This is a trivial entropy reduction here. So this kind of detection is uh, 
I think it is it is not a not a uh, a good one because it is it is really trivial to bypass. Uh, the red one is the encrypted payload. Uh, let's assume that it is a random one, and if we do nothing more, nothing more, just inject two A bytes between each encrypted byte. It is a longer sequence, uh, three times longer. But uh, if you calculate the entropy for this one, it is very low. Why? Because this one is not random. Because if you know nothing, just uh, want to predict the following byte in this uh, lower sequence, then it is it will be A uh, with two-third probability. So this is not random. Why the first one is assumed random because it is encrypted. So with this very trivial trick, we could reduce the entropy of any payload. Of course, during the decryption phase, you have to do a little bit different. You have to, you have to follow only the third bytes uh, for the decryption. Okay, uh, and one other uh, minor trick for bypassing, uh, bypassing uh, static analysis of uh, EDRs. Uh, the shell code loaders and DLL loaders uh, usually use Windows API call, may use Windows API calls like VirtualLock and other, uh, there are some other general uh, API calls used for, used for uh, uh, the shell code uh, execution and decryption and other phases. Uh, and if you include, uh, your, include these Windows API calls, then it is very trivial for an EDR to enumerate it because these are, these are import functions. And if you want to, if you don't want to, don't want to import these functions but call these functions, uh, there is an easy method. Uh, let's resolve the function addresses dynamically at runtime. With, the, with these two API calls, the get module handle and get prods address, you can resolve uh, the API uh, call address dynamically at runtime, and if you do this, the compiled binary won't have the virtual alloc import. You can do this with every other uh, API functions uh, you want to call. And this appears to be less harmful, at least at first sight, and uh, if these calls are not included uh, in the payload, then EDR uh, will not score it uh, high uh, for treating it malicious. There is an other little trick I uh, usually use, hide the function name strings also, because, okay, you do not have the import uh, in this, but the virtual alloc string is there. If you want to uh, not include this string, there is a very easy, very easy trick. Uh, at the this is C code. At the first line, if you if you use the first line, then the string will be included uh, in the air data section of the compiled binary continuously. But if you use the second one, uh, the compiler will include it with move instruction instructions uh, in the text section and and there won't be the, 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 the string will chunked. So this is just a, this is a minor trick, but very useful. Uh, what I, how I use this? Uh, I wrote my own custom loader, including these three or two techniques. Uh, the DLL unhooking, the most important to, uh, for evading uh, uh, runtime detections and reducing the runtime EDR visibility. Uh, the second one, the entropy reduction, and third one, uh, some um, some static analysis uh, uh, evasion uh, using the dynamic Windows API calls. These are known techniques, not new. These are known techniques, but still works uh, successfully even in 2022. So I packed all these into a custom loader, and uh, usually 
we use for offensive operations the Cobalt Strike C2 framework. Uh, the Cobalt Strike is a popular, or probably the most popular nowadays, the most popular commercial C2 framework. Uh, this is used by red team operators for adversary simulations, but it is used as well as adversaries, illegally, of course. Uh, now the defaults, uh, if, you, if you use Cobalt Strike with the defaults, uh, it is called by EDRs. Uh, but wasn't the case a few years ago. A few years ago, if you use the Cobalt Strike out of the box, it bypassed everything. Now the defaults are, now the defaults are code, but it is highly malleable and customizable. So the power of Cobalt Strike uh, framework is the customization. Uh, uh, for example, the payloads are generated according to some, uh, you, can, you can tune some parameters, but the payload is generated uh, uh, without uh, much customization, but the loaders are templated. So you can write your own loader and use your own loader in this framework. And I wrote my own loader using uh, these uh, techniques. This is called uh, the artifact, in Cobalt Strike terminology, this is called artifact kit. Uh, I, when I included these, only these three techniques in the artifact kit and generated the Cobalt Strike payload, uh, this allowed me to first run the Cobalt Strike beacon without alerting. So it connected and, and uh, I had control over uh, the target computer. I could run basic tasks even with spawn processes and I could run uh, malicious .NET assemblies. It is very important for offensive operations uh, most of the offensive tools or a lot of offensive tools are written in .NET. Uh, something like Rubaus, uh, it is a very uh, handy uh, offensive tool for operating with in-memory Kerberos tickets. Uh, we can also run Mimikatz and other things in, uh, uh, in the, with this Cobalt Strike Beacon if we use this uh, unhooking technique. Uh, I would say that this is not superpower. Uh, telemetry other than DLL hooks are still alive. Uh, if you remember the, that uh, diagram, uh, some slides before, uh, there were kernel callbacks, there were uh, file system or network events logged. So other telemetry data exists. Uh, for example, if you want to try to dump uh, the LSS process uh, with uh, the credentials or credential hashes included, it most likely will end your operation. So the EDR unhooking is not a superpower, but, and also know that everything may depend on custom detections, but uh, in a real, uh, if, you, if you plan your offensive operation well, then dumping LSS and doing other uh, high alerted things is not necessary. Uh, if you want to, learn more about the artifact kit, let me, uh, let me become, and there is an offensive coding class by Mr. Unicoder there, there is the link. And I presented there a two hour live coding session covering these features uh, in this uh, artifact kit template. And the recording is available there if you want to see it. Back to the detection technique. Uh, there are some more advanced uh, detection techniques, uh, it, it, is, it requires more advanced uh, stuff to bypass uh, the kernel callbacks. I do not want to dive into the deep details. Uh, for ca bypassing kernel callbacks is uh, not easy with low privileges because you cannot uh, simply overwrite it. You have to evade the kernel calls uh, what is hooked by callbacks and uh, uh, recently, I faced an issue with the load library one. The load library uh, Windows API call, uh, called a kernel function uh, what was hooked uh, by kernel callbacks. And uh, so it, the situation, the simple EDR DLL unhooking did not work uh, because uh, not the uh, not, the load library was not uh, hooked at the user process level, it was hooked at the kernel process level. And there is a, for this, so for this one, there is an easy solution uh, because uh, 
it was implemented earlier. This is the dark load library. This is a load library uh, implementation without calling load library itself. So uh, Betsek, the author of dark load library, implemented load library without calling load library. And uh, I did some uh, experiment with another open source, uh, with another C2 framework, an open source one, Sliver, uh, which has the payloads uh, as DLL, and, uh, and a default uh, reflective loader using these DLS will trigger its kernel callback, and with dark library, dark load library, I was able to bypass it. Uh, what I did, uh, this is the sliver C2 stager. Uh, I, com I combined these techniques, uh, the DLL unhooking uh, and the dark load library one. Uh, this made it possible to uh, made it possible to evade the kernel callbacks, and I also uh, have an interesting uh, an interesting uh, usage the DLS side loading. What I want to show uh, now, uh, I used it for Zoom. So, what is DLS side loading? Uh, DLS side loading is DLS side loading is a technique. Uh, to abuse the DLS search order pass uh, uh, weakness. Uh, the Zoom binaries uh, leave uh, in the user folder app data backslash Zoom backslash bin. Uh, the user, uh, the Zoom binaries uh, are installed in the user folder. And the Zoom.exe is vulnerable to DLL hijacking. Uh, which means if you place a DLL, uh, what Zoom wants to load, uh, first it searches in this, in this bin folder. For example, if it wants to load the system DLL, it won't find in the bin folder, but, but first it searches in the bin folder and then moves to the system 32 at last. So if you place, uh, a, for example, a version DLL file, uh, what is loaded by Zoom, uh, it is a system DLL. First, it looks for the version DLL in the bin folder. And if you drop a version DLL, a malicious version DLL in the bin folder, then it will be loaded. Why is this important? Because uh, if, you, if you write the malware, uh, what just drops uh, its payload uh, in this bin folder and doesn't do the payload execution, uh, the payload execution uh, will follow when the user opens the Zoom application. So it is separated by time and method. Uh, probably the payload was dropped uh, yesterday, and today user opens Zoom. And, user, uh, and the user, when uh, it opens Zoom, uh, these two events, the payload dropping and, uh, and the Zoom uh, execution, is not connected and uh, EDR won't connect the drop and exec events. So for example, if the EDR uh, score threshold is, for example, let, let it be uh, 100, maybe, uh, maybe the malware dropping is uh, 80 and uh, execution is also 80, it is not added and it will not trigger the alert. If the malware did the two stuff uh, uh, on its own, then it will trigger. So this is a uh, this is a dangerous one. There is a protection. There is a protection against uh, DLS side loading in Zoom. Uh, here is the protection. Uh, here is a pop-up window. Zoom.exe is using version DLL from an unknown publisher. Are you sure you want to continue or want to run this software? Uh, the problem. There, is, there are two problems with this. First, it allows the user to continue. Why? It should not. And second, this is the this is the this is the verse. The DLL, the version DLL, gets executed before this pop-up shown. <laughs> so, so I would like to uh, show my dumbest ever bypass technique here. Here it is. Uh, in version DLL, there is a loop for finding the window zoom, the zoom pop-up window, and then send a message to this window, yes, it's clicked, yes. Uh, this is very, very quick, 
and this will this will this code will run before uh, the window is rendered on the desktop. <laughs> so there is no pop-up window. This is this is the dumbest dumbest bypass server, but this is working. Uh, it is just a screenshot. Mm, I fear you cannot read it, but um, this is just a demonstration ver uh, screenshot uh, for this. There is the version DLL. Uh, Zoom opens and the sliver C2 uh, framework connects back. And if you uh, implemented this dark road library technique against uh, EDR and also the unhooking technique, and uh, even uh, after this, you can you can run, for example, Mimikatz here. So I just uh, try to show this uh, without mentioning any EDR products. And okay, so that was that was the Zoom. And now here is my here is my favorite, uh, the living in network protocols uh, section. This is a this is the best EDR bypass technique, I think. Uh, so let's say we have a C2 implant and an EDR protected host. Okay, so we have an initial foothold. We have a C2 implant and a protected host, uh, and here is how to operate in the most stealthy way, I think. Uh, the key is to not, run, you do not have, you must not run any malicious uh, tools uh, on the EDR protected host itself. Let's run uh, your offensive tools outside the network. How? Just fire up a SOX proxy in the implant. Most C2s uh, support it out of the box. For example, Global Strike has it. Also, the open source sliver has it. And run your tooling on your own operator host through that proxy. Uh, so tools are outside EDR sensors. EDR uh, cannot attach any process, um, only the C2 implant. If the C2 implant is bypassed, and hopefully the SOX, uh, SOX process is bypassed, for example, with EDR unhooking, the visibility is nothing, almost nothing in this process. Uh, you do not have to spawn new processes, do not have to inject processes, just uh, operate through the network. So this is almost invisible to EDRs. Uh, I would like to show an example, uh, probably a, a little bit advanced, more advanced attack, uh, what could be, uh, what could be, uh, managed by this uh, infrastructure. Uh, let's say the NTLM relaying one, the computer takeover scenario, shame. Uh, let's say you have a compromised attack server station running the C2 implant. For the NTLM relaying, you have a target computer, you have the domain controller. Uh, the NTLM relaying is uh, a very sim oversimplify overly simplified. Uh, you try to coerce an NTLM authentication from the target to, the, uh, to your uh, controlled computer and relay it to the domain computer. And through this relayed session, you make some object modifications on the target. And um, the last step, obtain local admin privileges on the target uh, by abusing these modified uh, uh, computer object properties via Kerberos. So this is very oversimplified, but I show this in, a, an, in this diagram. So you have the compromised host running the C2 implant. The first step, coercing authentication with some technique on the target computer. Uh, if someone familiar with it, it may be the printer bag or, or the petit pot. There are other. Uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of techniques to coerce authentication. Uh, my favorite is uh, printer bag because it is a one fix. Uh, exploit or vulnerability. Microsoft says that this is, uh, uh, this is a feature, not a bug. So you can uh, coerce authentication with credentials on target computer. Uh, you can obtain the NTLM authentication and target it to the compromised host. And from the compromised host, you can relay it to the domain controller. Uh, this is an SMB connection from the target to the compromised host, but you can relay this to LDAP to the domain controller. And through this, and now you have a LDAP session in the context of the target computer. And with that LDAP session, you can modify the target computer's properties. And after, after modifying this, 
with some techniques called shadow credentials or, or resource-based constraint delegation, you can have local admin privileges uh, like Kerberos. So the problems with this uh, in operational security uh, perspective, uh, so there are operational security concerns. If you, in this, in this scenario, uh, sorry, in this scenario, uh, the tools are running on your uh, compromised attacker host. Uh, it is in the VD EDR visibility, and also one more, because this is an SMB connection from the target to your uh, controlled host, uh, what is usually Windows and have SMB services, uh, you have to do something to uh, filter the traffic and uh, redirect it. Uh, there, are, there, is, there is an offensive tooling for this, the port bender, uh, to have uh, uh, to filter the SMB connection from the target and uh, redirect it to another service. Uh, but for this, you have to, you have to uh, run a, uh, deploy a driver. Uh, there are a uh, lot of concerns with this. Uh, deploying a driver, a malicious driver on, a, on, a, on an EDR protected host. So I won't say this is impossible, but, uh, but maybe really hard. But there are uh, solutions to solve this. Uh, let's run a SOX and the reverse port forwarder inside the C2 implant and run the tooling on the operator's host outside of the target network. So this one. Uh, we have a SOX proxy on the compromised host, uh, which can be reached by the operator. And let's do a reverse port forward from the SMB port to the operator host. And now we can trigger the authentication through that SOX proxy. So we run the printer bug exploit or any others uh, on our operator host. And if we have the relayed connection, also run the relay tool on the operator host uh, through the traverse port forwarding. And again, on the SOX proxy, let's go to the domain controller and finish the, uh, the exploit. So uh, almost everything is running on the operator's host, no tooling on the compromised attacker host. So this is almost very good. Uh, tooling is outside EDR visibility, almost all tooling. St uh, still a concern. Uh, we also need the port bender driver uh, in, this, uh, in this scenario. And the last thing I uh, wanted to show you we can uh, solve this also. So do not need to run a driver on the EDR monitored host for this attack. Let's try to find the host uh, inside the network without running SMB or EDR visibility, probably an unattended test box, or even an IoT device running Linux, preferably, could be very fine. Uh, usually you can find this on a, an enterprise network, uh, with default credentials or, or uh, other unprotected uh, hosts. Here is the shame. Let's let it be an, a, a camera with Linux operating system. Uh, almost the same as the previous one, but let's redirect the uh, let's cause the authentication to the target, uh, on the target computer, not to the compromised attacker host, but to the compromised device. And let's run an SSH tunnel, a reverse SSH tunnel through that SOX proxy back to the operator's host. Uh, so let's forward the SMB port on the compromised device through that reverse tunnel to the operator's host. And now if you trigger the authentication on the target computer, it will land on the operator's host through that SSH reverse tunnel. And now uh, we bypassed the compromised attacker host uh, in this scenario totally. And of course we can uh, relay that authentication to the domain controller uh, through the SOX proxy and uh, modify the computer object properties. And, uh, and the last step through that SOX proxy uh, we can uh, go to the target computer and obtain local admin. So that's that was the last thing I wanted to show. Uh, this is the living in the network protocols. I think this is the this is the best way to bypass CDR. Uh, let's try to not touch anything on EDR protected hosts. 
Okay, uh, a short summary. I presented uh, some practical bas basic EDR bypass techniques. Uh, using these, uh, I'm using these actively during engagement. Uh, so defaults can be bypassed with effort, not just defaults more. Uh, but I do not want to mean, so uh, this do, do, don't mean to say it is easy or e easy or EDRs don't perform well. So I do not want to just blame the EDR vendors or EDRs uh, because a well uh, configured uh, and, uh, and if, if you include some uh, customization in EDRs and uh, include some uh, advanced detections, uh, then it will be very hard uh, to bypass those detections. Uh, even if you, just one reason uh, why this is very hard, because you do not know uh, which kind of detections are included uh, on the enterprise uh, uh, EDR products. So the defaults can be easily bypassed uh, or bypassed with effort, but if there are some uh, uh, neat uh, detections there, then it could, it could be very hard to bypass and EDRs are uh, could be ex extremely useful. Okay, so sorry for the overtime. Thanks for your attention. If you uh, have questions, uh, I'm here. I don't go away. And you can also reach me out at Twitter. I actively use my Twitter account. So thank you. Thanks, Istvan. Thank you.